Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of Fight Chat Friday. Uh, we are Taekwondo Coach Academy, that's Adrian Byrne and Richie Ford and every Friday we're being, bringing you a little bit of a taster of the very best of ITF competition, some coaching, uh, some of our tips, tricks and cues and we're hoping to really dissect the very best of what's on offer in ITF Taekwondo. If that sounds like a conversation you'd like to be a part of then just pause this video, go and subscribe and hit that bell button if you'd like to get notifications every week when we go live. So. Richie, do you want to introduce what today's topic is? Yeah, so today what we're going to look at is ITF versus WACO. So last week we did a video ITF versus ITF, just a little bit of a contrast on the different groups. So that went down pretty well and some people suggested it would be cool to have a look at ITF versus WACO. So that's today's plan. So just before we get started on that, I just want to say a shout out to some of the people who videos we have been using for this particular fight chat Friday, so Brian Mandan, Oleg Solovey, and some official streams of the ITF Euros from 2018 and 19. So just before we get into it, um, ITF and WACO are quite similar, so you see a lot of crossover from both sets of fighters generally. General rules are similar, but of course then there's some differences in particular with exits and scoring value, things like that. So we're going to have a look at some of those things and how they affect um, the different aspects and some different skill sets that you need to develop. Um, so we're definitely going to have a look at that. We're going to use some high-level ITF and WACO competitors to hopefully contrast a little bit. So we have some fights that um, both fighters have actually fought in ITF and WACO, so it'll be cool to compare those. And some of those, these fighters include Alameen Ramadan, Timothy Boss, Kachi Solovey, Sam Del Rock, Gilles Brown, Eno Hare, and Jenny Lahan. So all of these have been either ITF European Championships winners or finalists. So you know that it's going to be um, high-level skill sets and everything like that when we have a look at these guys. So that would be fantastic. So if you're interested in this video, and make sure hit the video a like so we'll get started. And it would be cool also to see who's representing who, sir. So we can comment below what style you come from. So whether that's ITF or WACO, comment below ITF or WACO. We'll see who's joining in on this. And of course, don't let your side down. So get involved and comment below. So Adrian, will you go through some of the topics we'll be covering today? Yeah, sure. So for today's video, we're going to look at some of the choices that the competitors are making in terms of their shot selection and we'll compare the volume of shots that you're going to see in ITF versus uh, wacko kickboxing and particularly the uh, continuous. We're going to look at exits and the space that's in the ring. So in all of the fights that we're showing, the ITF fighters will be on an 8 meter by 8 meter ring. The wacko fighters are going to be on a 7 by 7 ring and we're going to see what difference that makes. The little variations in the rules, uh, they're significant. We're going to have a look at those and the value of the scores and in particular when we're looking at the, the kick to the body and that being a one point score in WACO and a two point score in ITF Taekwondo. Uh, we'll look at some different skill sets that emerge because of those differences in the rule sets and the tactics and in particular we're going to look at uh, some evasive movement uh, especially as there's someone with a lead at the end of a match. We'll have a look at changes in stance and this is particularly interesting because it's the same competitors that are fighting but with a slightly varied uh, stance or uh, strategy depending on the rule set that they're in and we'll look at the range or the distance that uh, fighters select when they go head to head. So let's have a look maybe at the first one which is a, just a little bit of an overview, a summary uh, maybe and a good place for us to start and a retired competitor now but an absolute legend in ITF Taekwondo and to some degree as well in WACO having won multiple titles in both. So we're going to have a look at some of the uh, some shots from uh, Catch Solovey's highlights. So uh, we'll start with a little bit of the kickboxing. And, you know, straight away, some of it, it is a highlight reel kind of, kind of event, and you, you will see some very, very nice shots picked. But I do think that's one of the things that ITF competitors can bring to WACO a little bit as well, is a slightly broader shot selection than you'd typically see uh, uh, particularly within continuous, like you'd, you'd often see some more, um, some of these shots thrown, like the, the 360s, the spins, the back kicks in points when the person has gotten themselves a nice lead and they have that safety bubble. But you don't see these, you know, the, particularly the back kick, you don't see that shot the, or the axe kick in a, the direct shot 
in the way that you might in ITF. You don't usually see those in Waco. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And you can see those high level ITF fighters are well able to kick and when they can bring that to Waco it makes a massive, massive difference. So as you can see here, Catchy does a great job of being able to judge the distance between that long range, getting through to medium range and getting into short range as well. And then by being able to couple that all with um, nice entry and exit kicks, it makes a massive, massive difference to somebody's game, especially in uh, Waco, where you have that tight space and kicks are able to potentially get you some angles and um, pull off a little bit more space in certain ways that usually you wouldn't see. So it uh, can be very, very effective if anybody can bring that kicking game into Waco, I think. Yeah, and we're starting to see, uh, I think or you'll notice in this one, that if you're used to seeing catches, she isn't usually as open in her stance as she is in uh, some, particularly going to hands. But you can you can spot some transition, not errors, but you know some kind of telltale signs that you know this isn't her only code, and she adjusts her stance when she's absolutely sure she's going to hands. So when she's going directly to hands, we can often see that little bit of an opening out of the stance. The hands are coming up into more of a classic boxing guard, and then we're changing. So just to have a look at one or two of those again. Um, where you can see the change in guard and in she goes and it, it does change things uh, quite a bit for her. Um, whereas when she's in her more normal flow, she's a little bit more side facing. She's going to be, uh, the hands are carried a little bit lower and looser and the hands are a follow on there, a continuation following the kicks in. And I suppose that's her more normal sense, but then she transitions very well when she gets onto the inside and she's looking to get a, you know, a, to stay in contact. And that's one of the key differences I think we're gonna see across all of the fighters is that you can be on the inside and spend some time there in Waco and the referee isn't going to uh, break you apart unless you can't naturally work your way out on your own. And in the ITF, you know, the referee is gonna step in almost straight away before anything develops on the inside. So you don't get an opportunity to work from there unless it's pretty much instant. So you have to beat the referee's call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it, it's, almost impossible to be able to punch effectively from side facing completely so mm. in in itf we have three facing positions you have full facing half facing which is just slightly more turned one shoulder facing each direction and then completely side facing so you'll see here as katya is fighting in itf you she start off side facing and as she tries to transition to the hands you'll notice that that adjustment of maybe side facing or half facing to a little bit more full facing and i think it's very very important um, if you want to punch correctly, it, particularly so in Waco, because as you said, there's a little bit more continuation that if you're stuck side on, your body almost gets trapped. Um, so it's very, very important. And it's something that you have to be able to do effectively to transition between both. Because of course, if you stay full on in um, full facing, you're not going to be able to kick very effectively. So I think that that transition between both is a, a highlight of a, a very high level fighter. And one of the things that you'll find as well is that, you know, the the sidekick that's so prominent to both styles it requires you being a little bit more side facing to start yeah. so the what you'll often see is there's a need to adjust and shift between the stances to come into the hands effectively so it, the sidekick is often it's it's the fencing shot you know it's it's keeping the opponent away is keeping distance and then an adjustment needs to happen to allow the rest of the kicks kind of flow out of there and to allow you to continue to hands there's a mm. very, very kind of clear distinction, I think, as well, when we change over from this clip and jump to the next one, where you see that real side-on stance from Katya. And I wouldn't even say that's typical of her, but you're, you you see um, right after this clip, she's starting completely side-on. She's pushing with side kick, and you can see the transition then from the side facing into the hands and how it works. Um, and the, the front foot adjusts, the toes go forward, and then she's into the hands but the referee breaks it up immediately. So we don't have the opportunity to continue. This one's worth a, a little bit of a, a point as well. Just the exit. Like the same back kick didn't necessitate an exit at any point in time in the wacko fights. But here she can choose to take the points and the warning and draw a line under it. Let the judges put the score on the board. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the places where you might say, you know, our style can be a little bit closer to point sparring because the value of that single clear score is a little bit higher because you know there's a chance that there's going to be a break. So if we, you know, get to contact, uh, if there's any turn, if there's a travel, if there's loss of balance, if you get into a clinch situation, the referee will step in. So if you can have your clear score before you arrive in that position, it, it lets you kind of, uh, you know, adjust the scoreboard and then on you go again. 
Yeah, and I think there's two important aspects to this as well that as we've seen in the side on uh, version of catches, sidekick, the distance is extended a little bit, which means any contact is a, just visually a little bit more clearer. Of course, if people are, are much closer together, the, the contact isn't going to be as visually appealing to the judges. Whereas when there's a bit more distance between you because of that side facing stance, any clear contact is clear contact, which, as you said, it, it gives you an opportunity to draw a line under it and move on to the next sequence. Um, so that's very, very important, I think, um, as well. Then you have that whole idea of exits, that if you're making an exit on the ring, um, you're, you're in trouble there because three exits, I think, is that correct? Three exits and you're disqualified in WACO? Um, yeah, as far as I know, that's the way it is now. I mean, certainly you're, you're picking up a, a point deduction after the first one. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes quite a, a hefty penalty. Absolutely. The, just the warning in ITF isn't so strong. Mm. And of course, as well, you have to factor in the, the whole idea of only one point for a body kick in WACO, which means that people don't value the psychic as much as they would in ITF. So if you have a, a psychic, people are willing to maybe take that first psychic because it only gives away one point and maybe get to a little bit more dominant position with their hands. So um, you have that, that side of things as well. So maybe let's have a look at a couple of the, the bigger boys. So we have uh, Gilles and Alamine here. Um, so... We're starting uh, from the ITF perspective, uh, but we'll jump over and back as we go. And we really do see the difference with the size of the ring here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So we, we would work usually on an 8x8 eight eight in ITF, which gives you a lot more leeway to uh, move around, be more evasive, use some push and pull action to create some reactions and angles and things like that. Um, and you can see that obviously it, um, just the, the amount of action and volume as well in particular for some fighters. So you see here, Gilles is a lot more close where in this clip here, you'll see he has that space to move back, set himself up and try to create more space where that's not the case in Waco. You'll see here that it's a bit more um, hands on and a bit more in the pocket and it allows the hands to get a bit more involved, like we said earlier as well. So that's a, that's a big factor in the wacko. It's a bit, uh, it kind of entices a little bit more volume and action in particular in the closer range. Yeah, but it's a different type of action as well, isn't it? I mean, yeah. there's there's more consistent action, but the action is more consistently hands at close range. Um, and I think what you'll tend to find in ITF is that you have bursts of action uh, followed by the push pull, the little bit of dragging or changing of space, adjusting ring position. Um, and then you have your burst uh, and you have your score or your warning or whatever will happen. Um, and I think when you have that, like that extra range, it really does allow people to make more mistakes in their movement. So it lets a person who is pulling and dragging their opponent around the ring exploit weaknesses in your opponent's movement in their distance and in, in how they manage the, the control of space. And that lets someone, I think like Alamine in particular, he can be really dangerous on that uh, when he has space to move because he yeah. changes and adjusts the distance and the tempo and the rhythm so well. That's what makes him, I think, uh, super dangerous. Whereas in the continuous, in uh, in the smaller ring, um, in Waco, I think, you know, he can be smothered a little bit. And, you know, Gilles doing a great job of smothering him there. Um, you know, you have to kind of find your way out and it's, it, it does change the strategy completely. Yeah, we, we see here the the benefit of being able to get continuation scores and put combinations together in, in the WACO. It's 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 almost um, like a necessity in WACO, really, that if you can't really go with single shots. And I guess it's a, even the rule sets then are changed more because they have their own style of points, which is a bit more start, stop and direct scores. Yeah. So I guess they, they adjust the rules then to, to compensate that because they don't want that to be a similar event to points. Where in ITF, I think it's a bit more of... Um, in between both of these then again so i think you can see here that the close contact the smaller ring uh, just allows and of course the the whole idea of one point for a body kick in wacko that allows for a little bit more closer action in um, wacko as we can see here so the, the lads are kind of a bit more in the pocket they don't have that leeway of using some space behind them to reset get some space and go again uh, it's a little bit more um, action orientated and of course then that, that has an impact on the fitness and the cardio of the fighters as well. It, it's always something with the bigger guys look small, or sorry, look, make, make the ring look small, yeah. you know, when you, when you have that seven by seven. I mean, there's not a huge difference in the height between, you know, these guys who are sitting at six foot, six foot one, whatever it is, and, you know, uh, a 57 or 63 kilo fighter sitting at five foot eight. 
and you know it's not a huge difference it's like it's only a couple of inches but it makes it look completely different when it comes to the uh to the ring um and you know i i think you really see it when uh when there's a step back i mean yeah, uh, yeah. There, when there's room to move and maybe if we look at uh, a few clips just highlighting the the kind of evasive movement or even there with Giles, but the evasive movement that kind of exists when uh, and how it looks across the different codes in particular it's a situation that emerges in itf where you know you, you discover that right last few seconds uh, you have a lead and you can preserve the lead you don't need to engage Whereas you don't see that happen so much in Wacko, even where the scores are displayed, it just seems to be culturally a little bit different. So absolutely, yeah. We'll have a look here. There's definitely a couple of things that contribute to this. Of course, you got the ring size, you got the exits, and then as you said, culturally, it's probably not, not maybe I guess frowned upon to uh, maybe evade, but. ITF, they play a little bit more playing the game, as they say. So um, you can see here, towards the end of the matches, like you don't really have an option to back out. you got to still stay in that pocket, stay in that contact range. And Gilles going the whole way to the end, despite Alamine being in the lead. Here you see Alamine being in the lead again, but he has plenty of space to be able to move around. Um, here's a fight between two ITF fighters, Timothy Boss and Eno here. Last die in seconds, Timothy has no option but to keep going and ends up pulling off a head kick on the back foot as he falls. So um, usually in ITF, because of that extra space, because the exits aren't a big factor, you can see that people are able to pull around like here Alamine is doing, move, create angles, avoid. And that, that's just a, a big factor, I think, especially in the, the dying seconds of uh, both codes. I think it's a big, big difference. You see here again, as um, Gilles is trying to force the pressure, trying to get some contact on it. And yeah, I think that's a big, big difference. Yeah, and the the kind of shots that you can pick as well, you know, you can you can just put up a fence a little bit in ITF sometimes. So even if you don't want to concede ground, you can just keep the fence up. And it's a little bit of like what Timothy's doing uh, in there mm -hmm. with Ian looking to get in. Um, but there's because the space is more limited because you have nowhere to back up to or you know less space to back up into. I think when you're you know facing the fact that you're down but within a like a margin, you know, so it, it's still a winnable fight. You know, it, it, the, like Gilles there, I don't know what the score is. It's the same with Ian, Jason, Timmy. I don't know what the score is at that particular moment in time. But, you know, if it's winnable, they can put pressure on and, you know, the, the, the fear of the exit or, you know, uh, and losing it on that basis um, is enough that it keeps people in the ring, it be keeps people in contact and it does make for an exciting finish. You know, it, yeah, it, it really absolutely. does. Like that um, there is a, is a great finish, you know, and Timothy is doing extremely well to, to pull off those type of things on the back foot. But yeah. that extra one mat, I think, makes a massive difference because it just allows you to take a step back first and then adjust to what's coming to you so you can move, avoid, whatever. Whereas you don't have that luxury in Waco where you, you, you almost have to pull an angle directly straight away um, and, and, and circle the ring as opposed to taking a, a back step. And I think mm. that that's great. That obviously just creates a little bit more action as well. Uh, I think something that's an important factor in ITF in particular is that we'll actually see this scenario come up often, but you might have a fighter who's on three warnings, five warnings, and this extra warning actually flips the score. And we see it happening yeah. time and time again in ITF where this same situation happens, but somebody is more inclined to take an exit, which only gives you a warning in ITF. But because it's either your third, sixth, or ninth warning, it ends up actually flipping the scores and people may end up either bringing it back to a draw or flipping the score completely. And um, so I think it's actually, it's an uh, interesting psyche of fighters in ITF uh, as opposed to in the Waco style where they, they're kind of forced to not make that mistake. And uh, I think it just, it, it, it forces you to be a bit more um, in tune and more present with the scores as well as the warnings, especially in ITF. So you, you got to know exactly where you are on the scoreboard. I think. You definitely do. I mean, looking at it for then from a, like a rules progression kind of thing, I, I, I actually wouldn't like to see the ITF ring be reduced in size, certainly across all categories, but I would definitely like to see the change on the exits. So, um, or maybe one or the other. So if the, you reduce yeah. the ring size, maybe don't penalize the exits, but I'd prefer it the other way. I'd prefer to keep the ring size and the nature of the game intact. So having those longer distances, having that, you know, interplay on the push pull uh and and the change of range and tempo i'd like to kind of see that stay as a feature of our game but i would like to see the maybe the heavier penalty on the exits to where you know you're actually forced 
you know, to make decisions closer to the edge of the ring that are more positive decisions that, you know, are bring the, the, uh, bringing the extra action. So that maybe, okay, you have to work a little harder to put somebody in the corner because the ring is a little bit bigger. But when they're in the corner, they're in the corner and there are heavy penalties for the exit. So I yeah. wouldn't mind some little bit of a compromise between the two there. Of course, then you're always going to get guys who are bending the rules. So you see in, in Waco sometimes because they're not penalized for falling over. Yeah. You see somebody will just lift their leg and almost just drop flat onto the ground. That waste of time, get up, reset, and the match ends. Whereas yeah. in ITF, of course, that's a warning. So it goes back to the same ideas. It's just as valuable as an exit, really. Yeah, absolutely. As it stands right now. So we have a, a, a few other little things to highlight. And this is, a, again... Uh, two matches between uh, competitors who both compete in ITF and WACO and we have Jenny Lahan from Ireland and Sandra Rock from the Netherlands and they've had some great battles over the years um, and this one I think is in the Irish Open uh, and then uh, again at uh, in Sarajevo at the European Championships in ITF and you really you know I think the the story of this one is the difference of what happens when the girls come to contact with hands yeah, it's an interesting one. So Jenny got the win, of course, in ITF, and then Sam won this fight in Waco. So, of course, there's a little bit of contrast there, and it's interesting to have a look what that is. Of course, straight off the bat, you can see that, again, close quarters combat is what we're talking about here with the hands in particular. Very difficult to get off any kicks because you're obviously quite busy with the hands and you don't have that ability. Um, we see this combination here of defensive side kick from Jenny on the back foot. And it just turns a little bit scrappy, whereas we'll see that same combination, exact same scenario again in ITF. Uh, and just because Jenny has that luxury of an extra mat, um, it gives her the option to circle off and just get a much cleaner score. Mm. And so I think that, that that extra mat is a is a big thing that we highlighted earlier. It gives, gives you that distance to create cleaner scores for the referees and almost make their job a little bit easier. Yeah, I, I do think that you know the more you, matches you watch, you're not going to see a defensive counter kick in uh, in Waco quite as much. You know, the, there is far more tendency to step into the attacking shot rather than to blend with the attacking shot and retreat. So, yeah. uh, and, and you know, number one, a, a huge factor in that is just how much ground you're going to concede when you, when you, when you do retreat with the attacking shot. Um, and, you know, you just can't afford to do that. It creates pressure so that... You know, even with that shot there where Jenny scores perhaps a lovely one point shot with the defensive psychic, it's two points clear in ITF. It's one point uh, there in Waco. Yeah. And then if you haven't stopped Sam and she still has momentum and she's coming into hands, now she has advantage ring position as well. So, yeah. you know, it's a huge deal. Like, uh, of course, like the, the fighters will adjust to what's efficient in each sport based on the rule set. It, it's just what happens. So that's why you see the difference here. It's not because the fighters are different, really. It's the rule set is different. Mm -hmm. And you see that, as you said, like if, if Jenny is using that defensive psychic on the edge and she concedes an exit, that technique was almost a waste as such. And she's she's actually not benefiting at all. She's actually on, on the other side of, of it there. Whereas in ITF, because she has that luxury of a bit more space, she's able to create the space, get that two points instead of one, and then she's still safely in the ring, and then she can circle off, reset to the center, and back to work. Yeah. So I think um, it, it's it's just a, an idea of the fighters adjusting to the rule set and being aware of what what's available, what's going to put them in a bad situation, and what's going to put them in a more favorable position. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I, you can see even just the the. The, the body position reaction from Jenny in this one where the defensive sidekick has put her to her front foot is past the back foot. She's gone mm. past side facing and into almost like the slightly to back, back facing. And, you know, as we were saying earlier, you can't punch, you can't get to hands when you're side facing, never mind, you know, almost with your back facing your opponent. And her having to recover and go back in on the same line in Waco you know, puts her at a, a challenge. Whereas here, she can actually circle off, use that turn to the back to continue and avoid the hands. And and I think that's you know, it's a very subtle, very small difference between the two. But yeah, uh, you know, it it does make a technique work or not work. You know, depending on um, you know, depending on the code and the rules that are following. Of course, we've got tie ups and clinching as as well in Waco, which yeah. allows you to work a little bit more on the inside. Whereas we said earlier. In ITF, the referee will break that up straight away and you don't have that luxury to be able to continue on your, your work rate and get that a little bit more dominance in particular at the closer range. You know, So I think it's uh, very important. 
yeah, I mean, you, you, we saw it so often here in the uh, on the wacko side of it with um, with deals where okay, it doesn't come to a clinch. I suppose Jenny was the best example of that. But when when it comes to hands, you, you'd expect in ITF when you know when the clashes happen, the referees are almost poised to go in there expecting yeah. the clinch and expecting to have to break. So here we might expect that you know there's going to be a referee po- uh, poised to jump in, and it's just it is that a little bit different. You can see yeah. how close the referee is. They're expecting to step in there, and you know it does change the mentality. So you can it, actually see it there in that little yeah. clip. Is kind of for a second they were up oh, and they realized they weren't an ITF. So then they just continue on working again. So it's kind of funny, and it's uh, it's great to be able to adjust from both. Really, see the little pause here. Yeah. They kind of expect there to be a little separation, and of course they get to continue on. So I think it's uh, two things here as well is the whole idea of um, shot volume. I mean. Wow. If you look at the the guys there in ITF, it's kind of, as we said, a bit more score, move off, score, move off. And again, there's a much more volume, as we see here on the edge as well, much more volume, particularly with the hands um, in, in the wacko side of things. Whereas you see here, clear score, move off, reset here, more volume, more volume, more volume. So I think it's a, a, a big distinction between both codes. And I do think you're right there in that most of the volume is with the hands in wacko. Um, and... I wonder if we weren't stopped as quickly in ITF, you know, when it comes to the clincher, when it comes to a clash of hands, would you just see then increase in volume of shots? Um, yeah. You know, because once you're stuck it's inside, you have to work your way out. Exactly. But it's interesting then because as we looked at last week, sorry, as you looked at last week, you've seen that the, the whole idea of the two punch rule in the other ITF mm. then promotes a little bit more spinning and things like that. So it's very interesting, just that simple rule of, punching makes a massive difference to how the game looks overall and the shots and the volume that's uh, produced so it's a very interesting rule set that makes a massive difference to the overall and um, like aesthetics of the game i guess yeah well i suppose that the, the big thing it comes back to principles so like we're still trying to control things like our position in the ring the space between you and your opponent the tempo of the match and one of the factors that does control that for people is contact so if you can hit them you know, it, it encourages them to stay back. And when you get into that closer range in ITF, you can't really hit as hard. Um, and even in Waco, the, the contact isn't super heavy with the hands. Um, it tends to be like there's more of it, uh, but it's it, yeah. it's not super heavy. But the um, what, what it tends to lead to is where well, you have to work your way back out. So there's going to be more of that contact. And it is a way of controlling, you know, where your partner goes next or where your opponent goes next. And in ITF, it tends to be that, well, I'll, I'll go in and then I'm going to have to close to that extreme distance because I can't stay here and punch. We're going to attract fouls. So, yeah, I do think it's, um, you know, how you adjust those variables and how you allow your competitors to control the distance, to control the tempo. Because the extreme is point fighting. You make one score, it's, it's over. So you can completely commit to making a connection mm-hmm. as long as you land it first to the more continuous side of it, maybe with the, the wacko uh, light contact, where, you know, the, the contact itself isn't super hard, but it can continue. And that means we can have that closer distance uh, fighting and we can have that, uh, the heavy penalty on the exits because you can exist in that closer space. I think the problem we have in ITF Tech One is you can't exist in that close space. Mm. There's no I think it- space for that in the rules. I think an interesting point on that as well is even we seen at the very beginning of the clips with Katya using things like back kicks and stuff like that as ways of like exit shots. Yes. So from you come into contact and that's like an exit to get out of contact again, which can be very effective because if we look at it in Wacko, if you're using a technique as you leave the ring, you're not pen, you're not penalized with an exit. Yeah. Whereas in ITF, whether you leave the ring as you're doing a shot or whether you just walk out of the ring. It's, it's an exit and it's a warning. So I think that's an, another interesting point that if you can if you can link those up really well to be able to make um, entries and exits with those type of kicks like the back kicks and things like that, I think it can be very, very effective in Wacko in particular. All right. So Richie, do you want to do a little bit of a recap of our major takeaways after today? Yeah, so I think uh, as we started off, I think the body position is something that's very, very important. So you need to be able to go from that side facing for the longer distance kicks and have a little bit more uh, range in the amount of kicks you can use. And then you need to be able to adjust that into a little bit more half facing and potentially full facing at that closer distance in 
the hand distance really and that's a big big factor in wacko and i think if anybody can do that and couple those really well together between the side facing half facing i think that can be a massive part that anybody can add to their game and uh, i think another huge thing is just being aware of the space that you have and just having that subconscious knowledge of whether you have that extra space to use or whether you need to take a direct angle i think that's another big impact of um what we've seen today uh, of course, we have this, the shot selection, and um, so we've seen a lot of maybe turning kicks, roundhouse kicks, as they're known in kickboxing, and hands mostly, whereas in ITF, because of that extra range, because of the body positioning, we can see a little bit more um, shots being thrown, so we've seen more axe kicks, back kicks, spinning kicks in particular, so I think that that's uh, another big difference that we've seen today. Uh, again, as we said, all of these things are, are determined by the rules and the fighters will become efficient within that rule set. Yeah, definitely. So I think that, that that's the, the major things that um, I've noticed from this. What about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, um, even from a conditioning point of view, there's a, you know, there's a significant difference. So, I mean, we didn't really cover the fact that the Wacko ones are often three by two uh, minute rounds as well. You get to the, yeah. the highest level. And, you know, that does change it when you're more continuously in action for longer you know it's going to take some of the explosiveness out of of it except for you know okay look if you're if your conditioning is supreme and you haven't been challenged all the way through your six minutes you might still be explosive at the end but most people are going to lose a certain amount of explosiveness just by the nature of the sport so it's going to have an impact in terms of how your conditioning goes and i think fighting in both codes is going to really challenge you know your physical preparation and training so i think that's something to consider as well Mm, yeah it's really interesting points there and even to see the similarities the things that you can take from each one yeah. and then blend it together i think that it, ideally because as we said if you've got points on one end of the spectrum you've got continuous on the other end and then in between probably comes itf i think yeah. that if you can pull and adjust and create your own little um spice there i think it, it can be very very effective for people to be able to cross train take bits and pieces from each skill set i think it can um definitely contribute to creating and developing as, as a whole holistic fighter yeah definitely and i mean above all else it's uh you know it's more fights more opportunities to test yourself and and, and often you know when you're competing in a code that isn't your primary code it's sometimes a, a way to test yourself under less pressure so in, in something that doesn't have the same significance or you know it doesn't matter to national team selection or something like that and uh you know uh again it's another way to make more friends so that can never be bad yeah absolutely so i think despite a lot of similarities and the differences i think that there there's um a lot to be taken from each one so i hope everybody enjoyed this video if you have and you made it this far be sure to give us a like and um, so of course that's your good deed done for the day on a friday so thank you very much and make sure and represent your side in the comments drop it down below whether you're representing itf or wacko which is your we call it your home style because there's a lot of crossover. So yeah, for sure. which one have you originated from? Leave us know in the comments. We'll have a, a bit of fun there and we can see who's representing a little bit better. Um, and yeah, that's everything from our side. Make sure and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And till the next one, we're here again next Friday. Talk to you then. See you then.